Good morning, Christ City Church. Good morning. I am Andrea. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ City, and I hope that you are staying warm wherever you are today. I feel like I've been in a worse mood this week because I've been very cold. Um, so I hope that you are staying warm. Um, I'm excited to be with you this morning. I want to take uh, just a minute to remind you again that small groups are starting this week. We have not been back in small groups officially since before the holidays. So I hope that you're able to join us. And um, I hope that you're able to join us. Give me one second. So yeah, small groups, we hope that you get into those. The link is in the chat, it'll be on the screen, and you can um, go on to that link, find the groups that are meeting, um, and, and jump in. So we've begun a new series uh, that's going to take us all the way through the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to be going through the whole book of Mark over the next year. Most of our small groups will go through the series together in their weekly discussions. And I also wanted to let you know again about the reading guide that you can follow along with. Each week, uh, you'll read through the section um, that, of scripture that we preach on the Sunday before. It's a couple of verses a day. It's five days of seven, and each day has uh, one or two reflection questions for you to consider. And we hope that the guide is something that will be helpful for you as we journey through this series together. So you can download the reading guide at the link that's uh, in the chat, and we'll put it in the sermon notes on YouTube and um, on our page, our podcast as well. So we're in Mark. So both Justin and Watson have given some background info to Mark, but I wanted to kind of hit some quick highlights as we jump in to our text today. So Mark is one of the four books of the Bible we refer to as the Gospels. Matthew, Luke, and John are the other three. And all four books were written to the early church. The Gospel of Mark is most likely the earliest one that was written. And while it's not known for sure who the author is or the exact community that they're writing to, it seems likely that it was written for a community of people who were already believers. So unlike the other Gospel narratives, Mark is missing some key things like Jesus' genealogy, um, the broader content of what Jesus teaches, so in Mark, Jesus will be described as teaching, but what he says isn't recorded. And then the end of Mark is also abrupt. You'll see it when we get there, spoiler alert, but there are sort of two endings to Mark. There's like a shorter one and a longer one. And most ancient sources end at the shorter one, which is right after the women find the empty tomb, very abrupt. So all these things seem like important things, and weird to leave out, but it might make sense if Mark is writing to a community of people who are already familiar with Jesus' teachings and his genealogy and what happened after the resurrection. It's likely that this is a community of people who are already trying to live into the kingdom of God, a people who are working out what it means to follow Jesus. From this perspective, I think Mark's intentions to write the gospel, this gospel book become a bit clearer. So as we journey through the book, one of the things you might notice is Mark's intentionality. In the Gospels, stories are never just stories. The Gospel of Mark is written in a certain way to a certain people, and the writer is very intentional in how the stories are structured, and the writer is intentional about what they want their audience to focus on as they listen to and hear these narratives in this particular order. So we don't have time to dive into all this today, but if you find this interesting, you're wanting to go a little bit deeper down that exegetical context rabbit hole, if you think that's fun, um, you could research the term Mark and Sandwich, which is one of my favorite things. Um, it refers to this like structural strategy the writer uses to sandwich three narratives together, drawing attention to like the middle of the sandwich. This happens again and again in Mark. You could also look some more into um, how Mark's author keeps Jesus's messiahship a secret. You can Google messianic secret. Some fun stuff for you to Google. All that to say, the author of Mark is not just recording memories of Jesus, but they do have a focus and a particular motivation in writing the way that they do. So they're writing in a certain way to a certain people. And then we are certain people who are reading it in this time and this place 
And while the author may not have been thinking about future hearers of their gospel account, we do still want to be looking for and asking the same kinds of questions the original listeners would have been asking. So in our series, in this Mark series, we're going to be breaking down this gospel into three big chunks. In this first part, which we're going to be in until Easter, our anchor verse is Mark 1, 15, which says, The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As we listen to and read through these stories, we want to be asking questions about the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is, what authority Jesus has. Studying this gospel together is the time to question what it means to believe, what it means to have faith. What is repentance? What do we need to repent from? And then if repenting is turning from something towards something else, what are we turning to? We want to question ourselves and our church about what kind of kingdom we're pursuing. It's possible that the author of Mark wrote this gospel account to a community of believers in order to remind them of the true center of the good news, the true values of the kingdom. The author of Mark writes with these like quick transitions or no transitions. They use the word immediately a whole bunch. And it's like they're trying to remind the hearers to not get complacent, to remember the urgency and the nearness of the kingdom of God and then to act on it. And it's right then for us, too, to consider the ways in which we have become complacent or drifted from the heart of the gospel. It's right for us to be reminded of what Jesus was about. And then it's right for us also to repent, to turn from those ways and return to the root of the kingdom. So in today's passage in which Jesus heals two people, these are the questions I'm interested in for us. And my hope is that we would be turned towards the good news of Jesus. So in our passage today, we're looking at the last two of three healing miracles that Jesus performs in the first and second chapters of the book. Like I mentioned before, Mark does not waste time with intros or story setup. At the beginning of the book, we get like a quick baptism story. We get the temptation narrative. And then in the same chapter, Jesus is calling his disciples. He's traveling around Galilee. And then we get hit with these three healings in a row. So what is it that we're meant to consider about Jesus as healer? What does healing have to do with the kingdom of God? What does it have to do with repentance and belief? As we explore these questions, I'd like to look at the two healings in our passage today using three of the five W's. Just going simple today. So we're going to look at who Jesus healed, why Jesus healed them, and what Jesus healed them from. Who, why, what, they're out of order. That's where we're going. So we'll start with the simplest of the three, who Jesus healed. Our text tells us that first, a man with leprosy comes to Jesus. And leprosy in the Bible can refer to several things. It's likely though that this means that the man had a chronic illness that was physically visible on his body. And then in chapter two, a paralyzed man is brought to Jesus. We know that he's unable to walk as he's carried in the story by four of his friends. Both of these people would, by the standards of the religious leaders, be kept out of the temple because of their illness and disability, respectively. And both of these kind of life circumstances would likely have been viewed as a sign of impurity or uncleanness. And therefore, neither person would be allowed in the temple, which was the hub or the center of the community of faith because of their unclean status. They are community outcasts and their exclusion from the temple would have other implications on their livelihood and everyday lives, including the very act of just being touched by another person. So of the many healing miracles that Jesus performed, it is significant about that these are named explicitly. It confirms what we talk about again And again, that Jesus has come for those on the margins. Jesus has come for those on the fringes, that the kingdom of God concerns itself with those who are seen by society as less than. This is who Jesus heals. I guess the answer to why Jesus heals could seem obvious. He's Jesus. 
he can, so he does. And that's not untrue, okay? But these two narratives emphasize his motivations even more. So in this story, we find two distinct reasons why Jesus healed. In chapter 2, Jesus plainly states why he's healing the paralytic man who has sought him out. So the scribes, or the religious leaders, are questioning Jesus' ability to forgive sins after he declares to the man that his sins are forgiven, that he is released from them. And Jesus knows that they're discussing this amongst themselves, and he addresses them in chapter 2, verse 8. He says, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. In this instance, Jesus heals to show his authority over both the spiritual world and the physical world. Matthew expanded on this last week, but Jesus has authority here and he uses it to again point to the kingdom of God to remind us that the kingdom is one of shalom, of wholeness, and one in which he has authority. So that's one. The second why is in the story of the man with leprosy. Jesus also gives an explicit reason for healing him. This is chapter one, verse 40. A leper came to him, begging him and kneeling. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. So this verse says, that Jesus is moved with pity. The The Greek word that's translated here as pity could also be translated as compassion. It's the same word used in Matthew 9 when Jesus looks upon the crowd of people and has compassion for them because the text says they were like sheep with no shepherd. And it seems obvious to infer that Jesus heals because Jesus cares. I think that's true. What's interesting, though, is that in some early manuscripts, some other manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark, this term is completely different. In fact, it would be a completely different word. and It would be translated not as pity, but actually as anger, that Jesus was moved with anger. And there's a lot of you know, scholarly argument on why the words are interchangeable in different manuscripts that I won't go into here. Um, But the two words may not be too far off in meaning, particularly when we remember Jesus's mission. Jesus is shown in the Gospels to be for the inclusion of those that were normally excluded. He understands his mission to liberate those under the bondage of evil, to bring true justice, to bring shalom to a world that was severely lacking both. Here, Jesus heals because he's moved by anger, not at the man, but by the forces that keep him entangled, by the presence of barriers that keep the man from experiencing God's shalom. And moved by his anger, Jesus heals the man, breaking down that barrier, enabling him to remain ostracized, enabling him to remain outside of the faith community. And in the gospel, we are called to belief in a God who not only looks upon us with compassion, but acts in righteous anger towards the forces that seek to keep us from wholeness to restore us to shalom. This recognition leads us to name what Jesus heals in both of these people. More than just their physical condition, Jesus addresses the brokenness of the systems around them that create barriers to their inclusion in the community of faith. Jesus' healing is an act of liberation. It breaks oppressive barriers and it defines what wholeness means in the kingdom of God. And it challenges us to recognize the inclusion of marginalized people as a miraculous act of healing. So in studying our text this week and in my own consideration of what Jesus is actually healing, specifically in the case of the paralytic man, I was particularly challenged by commentary written by theologians with disabilities. It was very humbling to recognize my own tendency to fall into a very ableist theology when looking at this healing. Namely, to see 
consciously or unconsciously, a person with a disability as broken or less than whole simply because of their disability. And I want to just acknowledge my ignorance here. I, I also recognize the ways in which I've heard this story about Jesus healing the paralytic preached historically in which sin and physical disability or illness are tied together. And this was a common view in the ancient world. It very much likely contributed to uh, people with disabilities like blindness, deafness, leprosy, um, or a paralyzed person not being allowed in the temple as they were, again, considered unclean. This is not what Jesus' actions support here, though. In fact, in John's gospel, Jesus explicitly disconnects this idea of sin causing disability. In John, when the disciples ask him about a person with blindness, whether, it was, whether the blindness was caused by his sin or his parents' sin, Jesus says, point blank, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He breaks that. In the narrative in Mark 2, Jesus does not immediately move to heal the paralytic man's body. Once he's placed in front of Jesus, the first thing Jesus does is forgive his sins. And it's this proclamation that the man's sins are forgiven, or another translation, that the man's sins are released, that stirs up the religious leaders who are present. By releasing this man from sin, Jesus is removing the man's disability-based exclusion from religious life in the temple. And this is before he can walk. Without discounting that Jesus does enable the man to walk, what then is the healing that took place here? Was the healing that he could walk? Or was it that he was welcomed back into the community? Like the man with leprosy, did this man experience marginalization because of the disability itself or from the systems that kept him out of the community? Jesus healing the man with leprosy and the paralyzed man is miraculous, but so also is the inclusion of both people into the kingdom of God. I'm privileged to get to learn from Daniel Harris. Daniel is a friend of Christ City who uh, I met through Matthew and Lisa. He lives in Memphis. He has preached at Christ City before. Um, right now he's pursuing a doctorate of ministry focusing on disability at Western Theological Seminary. And I got to chat just briefly with him this week about this passage. And he pointed out to me that the church's acts of welcoming and inclusion, particularly of people with disabilities, is actually taking part in healing. Those of us who are non-disabled are indebted to those who are engaged in developing a theology of disability. And we are and should be challenged to understand what shalom is in our physical bodies. And we need to be unable to discount the inclusion of marginalized people as a kingdom priority. And we're challenged to see that Part of the healing miracle itself is the act of faith that allows oneself to be carried by others, which contributes to the wholeness of both the person being carried and those that are doing, doing the carrying. Jesus as healer challenges our understanding of what it means that the kingdom has drawn near and it should cause us to question then what does it mean to believe and to repent it's right for us to exclaim with the crowd of people at the end of the Mark 2 narrative who are amazed at what Jesus is doing and say with them, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus is doing something new. Jesus is presenting something new about what the kingdom of God is like and what it means to believe and to repent. Jesus' connection of healing and forgiveness directs us to understand that in the kingdom of God, forgiveness of or release from sins is actually a part of our healing too. When we turn from the things that bind us, we are turning towards a God who does not just recognize the brokenness in the world, but is angry about it, is angry at the forces that keep us bound, and a God that works to liberate and release us from them. To believe is not just an intellectual exercise, but it's a full body, whole person experience. And in these stories, the call to repentance and belief is also a call to healing. It's a call to a restoration of our own wholeness. And I believe there's a word for us here this morning, friends. Maybe you are in need of healing this morning. Maybe you are in need 
for Jesus to address the things that bind you, what would it look like to ask for healing? Maybe you are desperate, like the man with leprosy. When he comes to Jesus in desperation, he is not scorned for inadequate faith. Desperation is not a lesser way to come to God. Coming to Jesus in desperation is still an act of faith. It is still an act of belief. Maybe you are being challenged to rethink what repentance looks like. Maybe you're being called to repent. Maybe God is prompting you to turn from that which keeps you from God, which keeps you from full participation in the work of shalom, both in you and through you. Maybe it's opening yourself up to be forgiven. Maybe God is asking you to consider the ways that you put up barriers for others. Maybe today, belief and repentance for you is allowing yourself to be carried to Jesus because you can't seem to get there by yourself. I believe, church, that there's a word for us too this morning. What does it mean for our church to pursue healing? What does it mean to seek to be close to Jesus and be healed? Are we asking to be healed? And are we ready to abandon the direction that we're going if it's not the way that leads to healing and wholeness and turn another way? God isn't calling us to belief and repentance in order to guilt trip us or hold it over our heads. God calls us to belief and repentance for our healing and for our wholeness. And to that church, we should say amen.